Uh, dear Mr. Vice President Telichka, thank you so much for having us today. Uh, let me kick off with uh, Iran indeed. Uh, there is a tremendous difference in terms of the way the two sides of the Atlantic are approaching to Iran. On the one side, you have President Trump, who is extremely determined for further sanctions against Iran. On the other hand, you have the European Union, uh, who thinks that this should not be the way to deal with Tehran, particularly over the uh, nuclear deal. So why do you think that it is in the EU's interest to preserve the nuclear deal? Well, first of all, I consider that unfortunate. I think that uh, the U.S. and the European Union are the closest allies uh, on a vast majority or vast uh, range of issues, uh, including uh, relations vis-à-vis -vis, uh, Iran. I would even say that on the basics we don't differ, but we do see, let's say, certain divergence in uh, recent, uh, let's say, months. Uh, uh, I would say that uh, uh, the Trump's administration has taken a certain decision without really engaging into in-depth, thorough uh, discussions with the European Union, so more or less a unilateral approach uh, after some consultations. And on the other hand, we still have uh, uh, politicians uh, in member states, but also on EU level, uh, pretending as if uh, the situation in Iran is improving. And the situation in Iran is not, a, is not improving at all. I think that we see uh, Iran among the uh, two highest in terms of uh, uh, executions. Uh, we see uh, uh, this also happening uh, to young people. We see, I mean, uh, basic abuse of uh, human rights. We see, uh, I mean, uh, speeches that are threatening, that are scary. Uh, so I think that uh, we first should see uh, EU and the uh, USA engaging into in-depth dialogue and, and really being consistent in its policy. That, of course, then means also on the nuclear deal. I mean, we can have second thoughts about it, but uh, that was struck. And I think that uh, the nuclear deal does give uh, a certain leverage uh, and does give uh, open up uh, also certain uh, opportunities vis-a-vis -vis Iran. So I would say that maybe the two uh, partners are deviating. And I think that we should be uh, mending the fences. And I would say trying to find, uh, uh, let's say, a mainstream uh, view. But that having been said, I don't see a reason why, should be, why we should be any more moderate on the assessment of the situation in Iran. I think it is really frightening, it is unacceptable, and I think that I would expect also Vice President Mogherini and the EU to be tougher on Iran than it has been so far. Mr. Vice President, let me ask you something specific. How would you comment on the recent stance of EU E3, E3 referring to Germany, France, UK, which aim to set up special purpose vehicle mechanism in order to trade with Iran and support the country vis-a-vis -vis the US sanctions? What is your take on that? Well, it is uh, related to what I just said uh, a minute ago, and I think that uh, uh, I leave aside whether uh, the position of the U.S. Uh, is entirely relevant, partly relevant, uh, less relevant. Uh, but I think that uh, you cannot, uh, in today's world, if you really want to have uh, a leverage, if you really want to have an influence, and if you want to push, uh, let's say, uh, 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 situations like the, uh, the one in Iran in a certain direction, you don't go unilateral. That applies to the U.S., that uh, will apply to the EU, to anyone. I think that multilateralism sh should be the basis. And I think that uh, uh, the U.S. in this respect uh, uh, are going quite far without sufficiently also reflecting that there are certain uh, realities, real politics in the European Union and also certain interests. Now, having said that, uh, I'm not sure that uh, uh, at the moment uh, the time is ripe to uh, say, OK, uh, this is... Uh, to large extent about uh, EU's uh, uh, economic interests in Iran, and we're going to do A, B, or C. Uh, so once again, I would say that uh, uh, the uh, situation in Iran, uh, the U.S. sanctions, the positions, uh, I mean, uh, uh, trade and economic interests, this is something that should be debated between the two primarily and try to see how we can mend uh, the f fences. Uh, so I would say that uh, that is uh, the, the first step. Uh, and, well, maybe we will go in the direction of a, a special mechanism. Uh, but I just feel that the, the message that we are sending out, whether it's US or, uh, or the EU, and showing that we are somehow divided, I think we are already losing weight. 
weight vis-a-vis -vis Iran and I leave aside whether it's the Americans or, or the EU. I would be tougher. I can see that there are certain economic interests. They need to be discussed. The Americans have to re reflect that. Uh, uh, but I think that uh, uh, there is still a few steps to be taken before something like that would be set up. And if I understand well, I think it was to be on the agenda of, of, the, of the council and I haven't seen it on the agenda. So uh, I need to inquire if there are not uh, some second thoughts or I'm sure that there are also different views uh, in the council. Uh, but uh, I think that that has to be still elaborated on and in a s somewhat broader perspective. Uh, for me, definitely relations with Iran are based on the nuclear deal. Uh, we should maintain that. But for me, the relations uh, in Iran are not primarily about uh, economic or trade interests. I think that we cannot be selling out on our values and that I believe that uh, the, all the democratic forces in Iran, the opposition, human rights defenders and, and so on, we can't be giving them up. Well, Mr. Vice President, I would like to continue now with Israel. There are many pundits all around the world and also uh, reliable human rights organizations arguing that the overall human rights situation in Israel is going towards the wrong direction. Do you think that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has a major impact on the overall situation of human rights in Israel? That's difficult, uh, I would say, to judge for someone. And I need to confess here that I have never visited Israel, uh, nor uh, uh, the countries neighboring uh, nor uh, Gaza. In fact, in the past, uh, I wanted to do so. I was invited to Israel, but I always said, but I want to go to see, uh, to see Gaza as well. I want to have a complex picture. So, you know, it's, it's uh, easy, I mean, to uh, shoot out uh, uh, some kind of assessment without uh, thorough knowledge. Uh, and you know that uh, uh, the parliament uh, and the EU, in fact, are divided uh, uh, to some extent in assessing the uh, situation. The shortcut answer would be that, uh, yes, I think that there is a spillover effect. I think that there is a certain impact. I definitely would uh, uh, not say that uh, uh, you know, uh, there are not acts and activities of the, of the Israeli government uh, that uh, do not deserve a, a critical uh, uh, stand from the EU. I, I, uh, I think that I can say that, that I've said that uh, uh, openly to my Israeli colleagues uh, a number of issues on a number of occasions. I will maintain that position. Uh, but uh, uh, still, we need to uh, thoroughly analyze in a complex way what the situation is. And I leave aside the fact that Israel is the only full-fledged democracy. Uh, they're basically confronting uh, uh, organizations, uh, entities and states which uh, still uh, see as their main objective uh, the destroyal of, of, of Israel. Uh, and yes, uh, I think that uh, we can be critical of the Palestinian uh, uh, administration being able to implement its uh, uh, powers in Gaza. I mean, there is a number of issues. But having said that, your question was different. Are there issues uh, that we would have vis-a-vis -vis Israel that uh, eventually could be uh, in the basket of human rights? I would say that some individual, uh, yes, and this is what uh, I would say friends uh, are for, like me, I would consider myself a friend uh, of Israel and that is why I uh, though I had to cancel my just recent uh, visit uh, to Israel because I was replacing uh, President Tajani at the G20 summit in Argentina. But I do plan uh, to visit Israel still before the end of the mandate. And these would be the issues that I would have on the agenda. Uh, Mr. Vice President, you are one of the few members of this House who were first to react to the attempted coup in Turkey back in 2016. Literally 10 days after the coup attempt, uh, you brought the sensitive matter to the attention of High Representative Ms. Mogherini with a question you underline, uh, where you underline, and I, and I quote now, right after the failed coup, around 60,000 people were arrested, sacked and suspended from their jobs. It is clear that the situation in Turkey is of great concerns. Referring to these words, which are yours, how different or same is the human rights situation in Turkey today, more than two years after the, after the attempted coup? Uh, well, I can have first say that you have a better memory or better findings than I have. Uh, I have already forgotten uh, uh, that uh, question, but you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, uh, bringing it back uh, uh, to my attention. Well, uh, I'll be very blunt. Uh, I, among others, I was also uh, the Czech chief negotiator of accession. 
And in that capacity, uh, well, even uh, years after I finished that work, uh, uh, I was invited several times to Turkey and I, I was a strong supporter uh, of uh, uh, Turkish uh, membership. And in fact, when I was commissioned in 2004, we had the debate on uh, the report on Turkey on the basis of which then the negotiations were started. Only four commissioners have spoken in that meeting. I was one of them and uh, it was two on two. Two were in favor. Uh, I was one of them because the Turks have complied with the conditions uh, from the Helsinki summit. And if you want to be credible, then you comply with your promises. That is what happened. But since then, a lot has uh, happened in Turkey. I mean that uh, uh, not with the, just the uh, but uh, uh, the overall situation in Turkey, which is deteriorating uh, in a number of respects, definitely in the state of democracy and human rights. I think that uh, while uh, Turkey is, of course, uh, uh, it's in its hands how it will deal with uh, uh, activities which do breach, which do breach, and there is evidence of breaching uh, its constitutional or legal order. That is for sure. But that it goes well beyond any of that dimension, I think nobody can doubt that. For me, today, the question of Turkey is a question of a country that is a important, if not strategic, partner to the EU, with whom we have very close relations, should have very close relations, a lot in common, uh, an ally in, in many respects, but a country uh, uh, in which the situation has deteriorated significantly, and a country, in my opinion, which not any longer complies with the Copenhagen criteria, the criteria uh, that were uh, established at the European Council in, in Copenhagen during the Danish presidency for uh, starting and conducting accession negotiations. So I saying that already for some time that the accession negotiations uh, with Turkey should not be freezed, but should be terminated, and we should be looking for a different quality of relations. I mean, definitely to build on the custom, uh, on the current customs union uh, agreement. Uh, we can progress on that. We can also uh, facilitate uh, still uh, uh, in the life uh, uh, of many uh, segments of the Turkish society, whether it's researchers, scientists, students, uh, citizens, small and medium-sized enterprises, large companies. Let's do more. Let's do it better. But uh, let's face it that uh, Turkey, in my opinion, uh, does not any longer comply with the criteria and we should not pursue the negotiations, we should not be fooling ourselves, we should not be fooling the Turks, and we should go for a higher quality of relations that we have today, but short of membership. Uh, Mr. Vice President, let's now talk about Russia. Do you think that the EU should continue to ally with the United States vis-à-vis -vis the sanctions against Russia? And more importantly, do you think that the EU is going to find unanimity in the Council of European Union uh, in terms of uh, renewing the sanctions against Russia? I have a very fresh experience. Uh, I just uh, uh, replaced a few days ago uh, uh, President Tajani at uh, the summit, uh, uh, G20 parliamentary uh, summit, so the leaders of the G20 parliaments. Uh, and I must say that uh, I heard an incredible speech of the first Vice President of State Duma of Russia, Mr. Melnikov. Uh, and it, I just felt that we are back in the, uh, in the old times of Cold War. Uh, I mean, the lessons that we have learned about how we should be respecting international law, how we should, we should not interfere uh, in, uh, in internal relations of other countries, meaning Russia, uh, what uh, the citizens of Russia want, uh, and uh, that the sanctions are basically are uh, illegitimate, etc. Well, it's not the European Union that enacted a part of a, of a third country. It's not uh, the European Union uh, that uh, has supported or even uh, uh, not just supported but in fact uh, uh, provoked uh, military activities on the territory of a different, uh, different state. It's not the European Union that supported uh, acts which led to assassination of uh, 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 some people on the territory of the European Union or let's say a third party. So we know what international law means. We comply with it. We are firm on that uh, for sure. And if we see a country which is not doing that, we, then it is legitimate that we come with uh, well-targeted uh, sanctions on those that are responsible. This has nothing to do with the Russians. For us, Russian, uh, uh, the Russian nation is a great nation. A nation that also sacrificed a lot, a nation that uh, really uh, contributed incredibly, not just in the 20th century. Uh, we are not targeting them. 
but we have concrete people that are responsible for the acts and activities that I've mentioned. And the sanctions, they work. Why on earth would otherwise Mr. Melnikov or on, a numerous, uh, on numerous other occasions the Russians be coming up and saying that uh, we should abandon the sanctions? So I'm definitely one of those that are fully, uh, uh, let's say, in, uh, in harmony with the U.S. I would even say that it's, it's U.S. that we are in harmony with. I think that this is something that we agree on. And uh, we and, and the U.S. And it works. And I think that we should maintain it. What would be the message to the Ukrainians? What would be the message uh, to civic society in some member states? What would be the message to our people that we would finally, without a, a change, a positive trend on the issues that I've mentioned in Russia, we would just give up? That would be just a green card for what in the future? Yesterday it was Ukraine. What could it be to tomorrow? So yes, I think that we should st uh, stick to them. We should be firm. We should at the same time come with, a, a, let's say, a whole strategy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russian entities. Why not facilitate uh, uh, the exchange and interaction with the Russian uh, research scientists, students? Uh, I mean, we can do much more. Small and medium-sized uh, uh, businesses, we can do much more. Maybe also visa liberalization vis-a-vis -vis the citizens based on certain conditions. We can do all that. But we should not compromise uh, on uh, uh, issues which are highly relevant and where we have concrete people responsible for con concrete, uh, I would say, even criminal activities. So whether the council will be unanimous, I can't say. But I think that we've got a strong majority in this parliament uh, on that issue and I hope we will maintain that uh, majority and I hope uh, that we will not be selling out uh, not just on our values but also on uh, th uh, those that uh, lost their lives. Innocent people, uh, where we've got concrete uh, uh, persons and entities in Russia identified to be responsible. Last but not least, uh, we are heading towards the European elections in 2019. Do you think that the European Union should be concerned about potential Russian interference in the upcoming elections? Yes, I, I think that uh, I, here I would be fair to the Russians. I wouldn't say that this is something that has to be attributed uh, to Russians. I think that we've got a serious problem and that is, uh, you know, uh, uh, all the fake news around and all the trolls and uh, uh, the technology that can be used. All the, the, que the whole question of cybersecurity, I'm, I'm one of the rapporteurs, I'm the elder rapporteur on the Cybersecurity Act, so I really went quite deep in the issue and it's a serious issue. It is an issue that can be related to elections and tomorrow it can be a serious issue related to safety and security uh, uh, of our citizens. And I think that we need to be serious about that. And uh, the fact is that there are more than just rumors. Uh, that, uh, sometimes Russians, sometimes somebody else. Uh, you know, we've got uh, uh, Cambridge Analytica. Uh, but we are looking at it uh, so far from the point of view of data protection, which is highly relevant. <coughs> but what are the political responsibilities? If, and wh how far are we in investigating? So I would not be blaming someone without evidence, but we need to investigate. If we f have findings, then uh, there should be responsible. And on the basis of that, we should act. And we should uh, uh, improve our uh, resilience, let's say, uh, to that. So uh, it is a serious issue. It, can, it could eventually affect the European elections. And me, as a member of the EP Bureau, will want to make sure that we will be as much resilient as we can. But it's, it's a tough call. Mr. Feisberg, thank you so much for this insightful exchange and thank you so much for your hospitality.